welcome here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Wundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land uh, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Uh, welcome to this uh, public lecture on a topic of enormous importance. Uh, what does it mean to be a, repu a monarchical republic or a republican mon monarchy? Well, I guess we'll find out from our speaker today uh, which of these sorts of things we are, we're in. Uh, my name's Trevor Bernard. I'm the head of the School of Historical and Philosophical uh, Studies, uh, which is a school of many disciplines uh, and centres of research. And we have, during the year, a number of public lectures which cover uh, all the areas of our research. Uh, our research, one, one, one of the research area that we do, and one thing we, we, we take a lot of pride in, is our research into topics, uh, of, uh, topics to do with Australia. Uh, and and this, this particular lecture comes under the auspices of the Australian Centre, uh, where we have a, a great deal of terrific work being done uh, in a variety of areas in Australian uh, studies. Um, we have a great pleasure tonight to present uh, a public lecture by Jim Davidson, a, a very distinguished historian and literary critic. Uh, but to introduce Jim, uh, I'm going to, 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 to hand over to uh, Professor Kate Darian Smith, uh, herself an Australian uh, historian of great accomplishment uh, and the director of the Australian Centre, uh, who will tell you all about our guest tonight. Kate. Thank you very much, Trevor, and uh, welcome everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here to introduce Jim Davison, who is an um, Associate Professor and, and Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Centre in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. Now, Jim has done much work on the British Empire. He's lived and worked in Britain and South Africa, and he's been very interested in the ways in which the empire has unravelled itself in the last few, well, last several decades. Um, he taught a course on the rise and, and fall of apartheid, so very much of interest in uh, South African history, but of course he's a very no well known for his work on Australian history. Jim was the editor of Mianjin from 1974 to 1982 and has several books including a history of tourism in Australia. His two biographies, Lyre Bird Rising, Louise Hanson Dyer, and the three -cornered, A Three-Cornered Life, the historian W.K. Hancock, have won half a dozen prizes between them. Last year, A Three-Cornered Life shared both the Ernest Scott Prize and the Prime Minister's History Prize and these are uh, really very significant achievements at a national level. Jim is currently writing a study of the founding editorships of Mianjin and Overland and studying uh, the ideas and lives of, the, of Clem Christensen and Stephen Murray-Smith. So with no further introduction, I ask you to welcome Jim forward uh, to deliver this public lecture, The Lost Option, The Monarchy and Australia. Thank you, Your Majesty. Just a little vulgar colonial touch. <coughs> Since the university doesn't provide jugs and, and glasses and we have to go out and get the water, <clears throat> Never mind, things are tough in the Accra Archipelago these days. A once proud empire reduced to a Cheshire cat smile and a wave. It's easy to make fun, fun of the monarchy, but I don't propose to do too much of that today. This evening, I want to consider the attempts that have been made to make the British monarchy more effective here, to comment on its present popularity, to concede the presence of a monarchical instinct in society, and to indicate the last option, a monarchy of our own. First, it's necessary, as a marker, to recall the monarchical position in all its imperial splendour. Arthur Balfour, later Prime Minister of Great Britain, was explaining to the new king, Edward VII, the nature of the empire he now ruled, and why it was necessary for his son, in 1901, 
to embark on a year-long tour of it. The king, said Balfour, is no longer merely king of Great Britain and Ireland and of a few dependencies whose whole value consisted administering to the wealth and security of Great Britain and Ireland. It is now the greatest constitutional bond uniting together in a single empire communities of free men separated by half the circumference of the globe. All the patriotic sentiment which makes such an empire possible centres in him, or chiefly in him, and everything which emphasises his personality to our kinsmen across the seas must be a gain to the monarchy and to the empire. Now the present opportunity, opening the first federal parliament in Melbourne, of furthering the policy thus suggested is unique. It can, in the nature of things, never be repeated. A great commonwealth is to be brought into existence. After infinite trouble and with the fairest prospects of success, its citizens know little and care little for British ministers and British party politics, but they know and care for the empire of which they are members and for the sovereign who rules it. Surely it is in the highest interest of the state that he should visually and so to speak corporeally associate his family with the final act which brings the new community into being so that, in the eyes of all who see it, the chief actor in the ceremony, its central figure should be the king's heir, and that in the history of this great event, the monarchy of Britain and the Commonwealth of Australia should be inseparably united. So that's the aria at the beginning. The recent death of Queen Victoria, the reluctance of the new king to be parted from his son for so long, together with the demonstration of imperial unity then evident in the colonial contingents in South Africa, joining the British in fighting the Boers, drew this lucid statement from Belfer a generation before the Imperial Conference of 1926 and the Statute of Westminster five years later. But it was not a matter simply of royal puppets being manipulated by the politicians. The royal family had their own perspective. Their understanding, as they considered the empire with its panoply of self-governing colonies, crown colonies, protectorates, and a whole subordinate empire in India, a conjury of polities rather like the Holy Roman Empire in their deeply Germanic past, was partly a dynastic one. And let it not be forgotten that the claims of royal families can be particularly tenacious. Franz Joseph of Austria, who was still reigning in 1916, was, amongst other things, King of Jerusalem, a title that had been held in his family since the Crusades. In Britain, the king had only given up the ancient claim to the throne of France in 1801, when the existence of Napoleon made it pretty plain he wasn't. <laughs> so one finds, in connection with this greatest of all royal tours, that it was the future George V himself, once the journey to Melbourne had been seen as a necessity, who suggested that Canada too should be on the itinerary. Dynastic concerns made it very easy for the royal family to get into the spirit of the thing. Now, until the reign of the present Queen, royal tours were special, not least because of their rarity. The Queen has been here 17 times, twice as many visits as were made by members of the royal family hitherto. Unlike her, none of them were reigning monarchs. Indeed, those seven royal visits could be characterised as follows. You can go to sleep in this pocket if you choose. First, the naval visits of Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh in 1867-68 as captain of his own ship, the Galatea, and then the visit in 1881 of the future George V and his brother on the Bacante as midshipman. So the two naval visits. Then you have three visits connected with the Commonwealth and Canberra. George's tour of 1901, already referred to, to over the first federal parliament, then that of the Prince of Wales, later Duke of Windsor, uh, to lay the foundation stone of Parliament House in Canberra, then seven years later, we're up to 1927 now, the visit of the Duke and Duchess of York to actually open the first parliament in Canberra. So you can see that while noting milestones in Australia's development, these visits did serve to connect them, exactly as Belfast said, um, not only with the royal family, but with the wider imperial project. Finally, these pre-Elizabethan visits include two by the King's brother, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, and his Duchess. The first was in 1934 for the centenary of Victoria, and the second, not till after the war, when he returned with his wife 
to act as Governor General from 1945 to 1947. Pretty long visit. Now, occasional Governor Generalships were a way of projecting a more substantial royal presence. Just as Canada had received the first royal tour in 1860, so, in a left-handed way, it received a regal couple in the 1870s, when the Marquis of Lorne was appointed Governor-General. His marchioness, that's what you call a lady marquis, believe it or not, was Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Louise, whose name lingers in the Rockies with the famous lake. If one includes Louise and her husband, then Canada had three royal governors-general. South Africa had two. New Zealand, none. Might this temporary devolution have gone further? There was, after all, the case of Brazil. In 1807, when Napoleon invaded the Iberian Peninsula, the Portuguese royal family fled, rather breathtakingly removing the court to Rio de Janeiro, a mere colonial capital. From there, the king reigned and soon promulgated that Brazil was henceforth to be considered a realm of equal status with Portugal and the Algarve. Eventually, the Napoleonic Wars ended, and in 1821, the court returned to Lisbon. But King Charles VI left behind his son, Pedro, to act as viceroy. Faced with myriad difficulties, and well aware that the Spanish colonies in Latin America were still fighting wars of independence, the king told his son that if he had to take any dramatic step affecting the relationship between the two dominions, he would accept it. The situation in Brazil remained confused. There was bloodshed. Suddenly, in 1822, the prince took a 180 degree turn and declared Brazil fully independent from Portugal with himself the Emperor Dom Pedro I. Pedro I. <laughs> Pedro reigned until 1831. These are um, Braganza, this is the house of Braganza in Portugal and Brazil. Bra Braganza hijinks with the marriage uh, to a, a Spanish Bourbon princess in Rio, to, to one of Pedro's sons. And he was then succeeded by his son, the infant Pedro, the, uh, Pedro II, who grew up to be a modest man with the temperament of a scholar. The two things don't always go together, but in his case they did. He attended the first Bayreuth Festival in 1876 in disguise as a Portuguese nobleman, although many had a good idea who he was. Perhaps better than he did. When staying at a posh hotel, he truly signed the register as Pedro. When asked to fill in the column designated occupation, he said, oh, emperor. <laughs> in fact, he was a man of science and culture and an indefatigable linguist, respected intellectually by figures such as Nietzsche and Victor Hugo. The monarchy in Brazil lasted a long time, from 1822 until 1889. So it wasn't a flash in the pan. It was ended only by a military coup. Its memory has endured as a kind of golden age, Thus it was that, while Brazil was casting around for a more effective form of governance after a long period of dictatorship, there was a referendum in 1993 to establish whether people wanted the monarchy restored. It failed dismally, being seen as no real solution to Brazil's problems. Now the Braganda de devolution, the Braganza devolution was unplanned, being more of a series of responses to changing circumstances and in its time it had come to work well. But it seems to have had no direct effect on thinking about the British Empire. Almost independently though, there were a number of parallel expressions of the need for some kind of royal devolution. One of its most interesting expressions occurred in 1867 with the arrival of Queen Victoria's second son, Prince Alfred, in my little recital at the beginning, the captain of the Galatea. Alfred had already toured the Cape in 1860 to such a claim that the landscape became littered with his name. Word of this would certainly have reached Australia, so that even before he arrived, a pamphlet appeared entitled A Proposal for the Confederation of the Australian Colonies with Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, as King of Australia. Written anonymously by a colonist, it is much less eccentric than might be thought. Even the argument that a court would improve patronage for the arts and sciences, they obviously hadn't heard of Campbell Newman, and benefit the carriage trade generally, is not quite as silly as it sounds. Within a few years of the Braganza's installation in Rio, its population shot up by one-sixth. The pamphlet grapples with the central issues of the day. There was apprehension 
which would become acute as Britain began withdrawing its troops from a New Zealand still fighting the Maori Wars, that the mother country intended to push the colonies towards independence. A statement made in the House of Commons that if Canada wanted separation, it only had to ask for it, appears in the pamphlet with the comment, sooner or later, our severance from imperial rule is inevitable. It was the common assumption of the day. The fear of a colonist was that it might occur before the Australian colonies had attained unity. A colonist pamphlet is thus an early manifesto for federation. The idea of separate colonial nationalities was abhorrent, all the more so since serious difficulties might advance to the point where they can only be solved by the sword. Remember, the pamphleteer was writing only two years after the American Civil War. And this explains the other feature of the document. Half of it is a diatribe against the very idea of a republic, repeatedly citing the United States. Hence, given the need for some form of federation, the seeming inevitability of separation from Britain, and the raw negative example of the United States, the proposal to make Prince Alfred King of Australia becomes an elegant solution. The writer of the editorial in the Advertiser, welcoming Prince Alfred to Adelaide, had read the pamphlet and endorsed it, but it seems to have had little influence. The attempted assassination of the Duke in Sydney obliterated it with conventional loyalism. Interestingly, a similar idea seems to have emerged in Canada, centred on Prince Arthur, who had served with the military there. But the most curious case, as often, arose in South Africa in the 1920s. In 1924, the Earl of Athlone was appointed Governor-General. He was Queen Mary's brother, and although brought up in England, had been a German princely. In preparation for his duties in South Africa, he applied himself to learning Afrikaans, then just on the verge of being recognised as equal official language with English. Not long after his arrival, the Afrikaner nationalists came to power. The new Prime Minister, Herzog, told Athlone that a statue to Paul Kruger, the Boer War leader, was about to be unveiled. He didn't expect the Governor-General to attend. But Athlone went along, rather upstage, not least by speaking in Afrikaans. Not long afterwards, he steered South Africa through a bitter flag controversy, and he became increasingly popular. There was even talk in national circles that perhaps he could become King of South Africa. Like that of the Australian colonist, this was a clever idea, since the Countess was herself a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. The doubly royal connection of the Athlones might help to wean away English-speaking South Africans from their excessive attachment to Britain. And while the ultimate goal of the nationalists would always be a republic, the severance inherent in this idea would ultimately advance that. But it was all a political romance, and the proposal never achieved concrete form. Australian Labour, before the trauma of 1975, was determined, in Gough Whitlam's words, to reinforce the Australian identity of the monarchy. Whitlam gave new prominence to the title Queen of Australia, by which Elizabeth is officially designated alone in this country, without reference to Britain. Everything else is covered by the honorific head of the Commonwealth. He also increased the frequency of royal visits, which became shorter and more sharply focused. It is also notable, though, that the one royal governor-general Australia has had, Prince Henry, Duke of Gloucester, was appointed by a Labour government. This was partly by accident. A Conservative government had planned to install his brother, the Duke of Kent, but these plans were cut short by the war. Later, the Duke was killed in an air crash, and so Curtin, who after all was in favour of an imperial secretariat in London, decided to substitute his brother. Equally significantly, when Prince Henry's term was up, Chifley tried to secure Lord Mountbatten as his successor. Mountbatten was also a member of the royal family, but with his naval career having been put on hold while he took India and Pakistan to independence, he was not interested. Even so, here we have the name of three royals in succession being associated with the governor generalship, not establishing a new line, as in Brazil, but constituting a kind of braganza variations. The Duke of Gloucester's incumbency is worth a closer look. It has been claimed, probably correctly, that the appointment was made to strengthen links with Britain. 
perhaps to counterbalance the new American influence that came with the alliance during the war. Moreover, the move would please conservatives and create a consensus at the time the government was intent on consolidating Commonwealth powers and extending them into the peace. The apparent conservatism of the Gloucester appointment served to give this program the highest seal of approval. Moreover, the Prince threw himself into the task heartily, travelling with the Duchess more widely than any previous Governor-General had done. His two young children helped engender popularity. All this coalesced to produce something like our own homegrown monarchy. The stamps issued in 1945 show this very clearly. Although stamps today are little more than suburban stickers, at the time they were official, engraved along with the banknotes and issued sparingly. They were almost minor acts of policy. So there the couple are, top, medallion side by side, as if royal rulers in their own right, summoning up empire in their uniforms. And I've also given an example from Spain and Monaco with Grace Kelly's elevation as Princess Grace. She has exactly the same format as the Gloucesters do. In 1954, the Queen finally undertook the royal tour that had first been spoken of since before the war. She nearly got here in 1952, but from Kenya had to turn back, returning to England on the sudden death of King George VI. When Elizabeth did come, it was as the first reigning sovereign to visit Australia. The country was delirious. Opposition to the tour was negligible. Even the communists were quiet. The former cultural nationalist Rex Ingemeld fawningly referred to our colourful and partially roguish history, convicts, and how our devotion to freedom qualified us for royal attention. There were Republicans, but their position was, la was largely grounded in the wrongs of Aaron rather than a vision for Australia. If there was a vision, it was of an inclusive, more descended British Commonwealth. The lead had been given by the Secretary of State for the Commonwealth, Patrick Gordon Walker, who predicted that the Queen would come to spend more time in the Dominions. I think we shall find that she not only visits the other countries, he said, but resides with them for considerable parts of the year, playing in them the same role that she plays in the United Kingdom. The idea was in the air. It was popularised by Neville Shute, whose novel, In the Wet, appeared in the coronation year 1953. Shute, originally an aeronautical engineer, was one of the most popular novelists of the day. An Englishman who settled in Australia and, while appreciative of it, remained distinctly British. If the novel is an indication, Shute had abandoned Britain because it was socialist in government, yet slow and conservative by instinct. Australia, on the other hand, was new and raw and developmentalist and, for him, agreeably right-wing. In an afterword to his novel, Shute explained that In the Wet was basically a cautionary tale. He was trying to picture the relations between various parts of the Commonwealth in 30 years' time, and the strains that might come to imperil the sovereign as the one effective link holding it all together. His purpose was serious, and in his view, fiction, the best means of expounding it. By the 1980s, in Shute's vision, the Patrick Gordon Walker prophecy has become fact. The Queen now spends two months in Canada and two in Australia, with slices of time elsewhere beyond Britain. But the existence of the Queen's flight, a Commonwealth Air Force squadron run independently of the British government, causes tension with the British Socialist Cabinet, caricatured by Shute as lumpen labour. Meanwhile, rather like the recent AV referendum, there is the defeat of a new proposal which also emanates from Australia, where it has been most clearly articulated, multiple voting. Shute is much taken with this idea, with up to seven votes being awarded to one person on the basis of different concurrent qualifications. An interesting idea for political revitalisation. In the novel, the defeat of the multiple vote referendum brings on a first-class crisis, compounded by a threat to the peripatetic monarchy. It's become plain that, shy of the strain, none of the Queen's children want to succeed to the throne. Her death would be followed by a string of abdications that could bring the monarchy to an end. So at the very time when the idea of rewarding merit comes to reformulate the franchise in England, it is also announced that the Governor-General of Canada, an Englishman, is to take office as Governor-General of Britain. Why had no one thought of it before? It certainly would free up the Queen to act simply as head of the Commonwealth, and in the novel her feckless children become, since there will be no laying of foundation stones, resigned their destiny. 
While the Queen's tours increased in, fre in frequency, if not quite as huge foretold, it was Prince Charles who was being primed to take a greater part in Australian life. The decision to place him for seven months in 1966 as a schoolboy at Timbertop was greeted with general approval. The idea had been well thought out. While the Prince would be attending one of the most elite schools in Australia, Geelong Grammar, he would be participating in the school's regular program of sending away Year 9 to a campus in the Australian bush. The Prince would thus not only become familiar with Australian ways, but also with the natural environment. By the time of the Fraser Government, there was a strong push to appoint him Governor-General. But the action of Sir John Kerr on November 11, 1975, had made this impossible. Apart from, to say the least, the sceptical feeling Labour now had towards the monarchy and its representative, there was the embarrassing fact that Kerr had drawn attention to the reserved powers of the office. As Gareth Evans put it at the time, if the literal language of the Constitution were to be believed, the Governor-General had all the status and power of an Ottoman sultan. What would happen should there be a fresh crisis requiring the adjudication of the Governor-General and thus direct royal intervention? Even if this prospect was unlikely, in the post-dismissal context, a royal appointment to the office did very much look like trying to turn the clock back. In fact, the monarchy had no greater champion than Edward Gough Whitlam. My government was not Republican, he declared in retrospect, saying that it was only the manipulation of the monarchy in the events surrounding the dismissal which led him to support a republic. We may believe him. Whitlam's work for an Australian monarchy has the authentic, too clever by half characteristic of Whitlamism. He was concerned to establish Australia as an entirely separate realm proceeding to Australianise the honour system and the national anthem. He probably genuinely felt that that was as far as things should be taken. For the conservatising effect of Whitlam's own legalism should not be overlooked. He saw himself working within the tradition of H.B. Ebbett as author of The King and His Dominion Governors. Balanced by a local person as her representative, the new emphasis on the title Queen of Australia could be taken as an invitation to bring the monarch closer to her people. Thus, a paradox. The greatest concentration of royal visits to Australia occurred during the Whitlam period. Prince Philip came twice on his own and again with the Queen when they came to Sydney to open the Opera House in nine, all in 1973. That year, Whitlam referred to Australia as a kingdom. But then he was always given to exuberant legalisms. When the Shah of Iran visited, Whitlam addressed him at a banquet as sire. Perhaps he thought he was a racehorse. Certainly his race was almost run. <laughs> the Whitlam attempt to Australianise the British monarchy was similarly unrealistic. No country imagines itself to be more republican or democratic in manners. Probably only the French consciously value egalitarianism more. Occasional royal swoops and scatterings of tinsel could only achieve so much as Australia stumbled, and stumbles yet, towards its separate destiny. It has been said, truly, that no one damaged the monarch's cause in Australia so much as Sir John Kerr. Amongst other things, his action reduced the Queen to a royal cipher, not even able to deal with any petition submitted to her. In response, one of the two major parties instinctively adopted a habitual position of hostility to the monarchy. At the same time, while populist moves in England might bring monarch and people closer together, here they come across as passing gestures from a visiting celebrity. Switch, switching on the television a little earlier to catch a program in 1977, I was surprised to find Prince Charles on the ABC music program Countdown. As the Prince spoke of the Queen's Jubilee appeal, cutting the air with half-square hand movements and with a chill in the royal voice, Viewers could see the scarcely concealed scepticism of Molly Meldrum with his years and arms. At any moment, he, it seemed, he might burst the bubble with some wildly inappropriate remark. You, Prince, me, Queen. <laughs> so royal tours have lost much of their efficacy and royal governors general are now politically impossible. John Howard recognised that in 2007. A Braganza-style solution is beginning to look more and more like it would have been a good idea for those of the royalist persuasion. But events move too quickly for this to be considered. 
until the last 20 years or so, the British would have regarded any such idea as impertinent. So too did Robert Menzies. In 1948, even after Indian independence, he insisted that it was THE crown and not half a dozen crowns. The concept of the indivisibility of the crown had lingered for a long time. The idea that you couldn't separate it into its constituent parts according to the various dominions. Even after it was formally ended, which it was by a series of enactments across the Commonwealth in the 1950s. But it wasn't just that. Australians too were loath to weaken the link. The link. Before World War II, Australia's proud boast was that it was 98% British. We still had an entirely defensive attitude towards Asia and were fearful of being cast aside, as happened to some degree during the Second World War. Even as late as 1965, the money raised here for the Churchill Memorial Trust compared quite favourably with the amount raised in England. So when Charles came to Timbertop in 1966, there was satisfaction all round. It seemed just the right degree of royal acknowledgement of new realities. But then things moved quickly. In came a reforming Labour government. The country became multicultural on the ground and in official policy, and the moment passed. Alan Atkinson, at the conclusion of his book, The Muddle-Headed Republic, outlined the four options Australia faced in the mid-90s. They were continuation of the status quo, a republic, shoot Gordon Walker-style recurrent residency, and a Braganza-style monarchy. Nick Briner, for one, said that if there were an Australian monarchy, I'd be as happy as Larry. Even Donald Horne was prepared to acknowledge such a solution, although he thought it bizarre. But the candidate Atkinson mentions, Richard Duke of Gloucester, is now even less well-known than he was then. Apart from anything else, and the obstacles are many, the Braganza option has never been a contender in Australia for want of a suitable royal candidate. I shall pass over the Keating period and the 1999 referendum on the Republic. The focus of this paper is the monarchy and the different attempts to revitalise the monarchical idea by making it more Australian. The idea of kingship has always had a primitive appeal. The elevated aspects of nobility, grandeur and continuity are yoked to an archetypal version of the basic social unit, the family. It is humanity writ large. Moreover, the trappings of power, if not the substance, have meant that the Windsors have had their admirers in places as different as the United States and contemporary Russia. You don't have to live in a monarchy to be a monarchist. Indeed, the, the disjunction might even help. In Australia, we seem to have gone one better. It was claimed six years ago that of the 200 imaginary never recognised countries in the world, 20 of them are in, or formerly in, Australia. First among them was the Hutt River Province, a wheat farm in Western Australia which seceded in 1970. You should remember, says its ruler, Prince Leonard, it's the second largest country in this continent. <laughs> but Prince Leonard, Casley, was careful, even while designing stamps and banknotes, not to challenge the sovereignty of the Queen. None of his imitators have, although some have, cheerly, uh, although some have cheerfully declared war on Australia, which, since they were ignored, they claim to have won. <laughs> Most are nutters who had a quarrel with local authorities. An exception might be made for the gay kingdom, based on an uninhabited archipelago in the Coral Sea, founded by a group of gay businessmen protesting about the government's refusal to recognise same-sex marriage. This particular gentleman uh, has a kingdom which is coterminous with the King's Cross flat. <laughs> Why Australia has engendered so many of these pretenders is a mystery. Perhaps at one level it's the persistence of thinking of the place as an empty continent and of the pioneering mentality. Most monarchies, despite the flummery, do start in assertion or conquest. But the rash of do-it-yourself principalities does indicate an annihilation or decadence of the monarchical idea in Australia. Attilation, or perhaps eclipse, was certainly evident in the rapturous response to Mary Donaldson's fairy tale marriage to Frederick, the Crown Prince of Denmark, and to the visit of Australia which followed. So much was this seen as a royal visit that one women's magazine published a 16-page supplement simply called Royal Tour 2005. 
There was also the suggestion that Mary could be a role model for Australian girls, as if crown princes were a dime a dozen and just waiting to be carried off by ardent Aussie Valkyries. Mary was commended for eagerly ditching uh, palace protocol. The tour took the royal couple to a reception of Parliament House, Canberra, while ticket sales for Mary's charity functions in Sydney approached two million. On television, she overtook the ratings for the Oscars. Unfortunately for the Windsors, Prince Charles was touring Australia at the same time. The aged journalist Michael Smith, even though his mother married into the British royal family and became Countess of Harwood, found the comparison dismal. Going to Melbourne's Federation Square for each visitor, he likened the welcome the couple received to a carnival. Charles's, by comparison, felt like a garden fete. A week earlier, Smith had already concluded, if there could be a precise moment, Australia's move to a republic seemed assured rather than tentative, then let it be last Tuesday evening at 8.10 at the Government House Ballroom, Perth. At this curious caravansary of prince, security men, aides de, aides de camp, women in, purple, in, sorry, women in purple frocks that once fitted, men with florid faces in thick weave suits that were once fashionable, I began to realise how poignant all this was. There was all the opulence and aristocracy, but also the same unmistakable sense of fading empire conveyed in the Levant's Sicilian setting, a world poised between its aristocratic past and independent future. The popularity of Mary and Frederick owed much to the fact that they gave royalty a fresh face, a touch of glamour compared with the dysfunctional Windsors. And as Christopher Scanlon pointed out, Mary's marriage, quote, played well to a culture fascinated by the idea of the nobody plucked from security and elevated Australian Idol style to celebrity overnight. More, the prince's choice of an Australian bride gave implicit validation to the rest of us. The unexpected intervention of Frederick and Mary gave a new twist to the debate. Bob Brown set up a poll on the Greens' website asking Earthians whom they would prefer should Australia not yet be a republic when the Queen dies. Camilla and Charles, the Japanese Crown Prince and Princess, or Mary and Crown Prince Frederick. Within a few hours of the posting, Mary and Fred shot ahead with 69% of the vote. Indeed, the, acc the acclamation of Mary and Fred seems to have been prompted in part by a desire for an Australian head of state, or, if you like, a royal of our own. In England, the Guardian made the playful suggestion that perhaps Australia could join a Danish Commonwealth, along with Greenland. But Australia's taking the Danish, the Danish royal couple to its heart did have a downside. This family portrait by James Brennan won the Bald Archie Portrait Prize a few years later. All hands are busy in this repulsive group portrait, with the prince, in Brendan's words, adjusting his wedding tackle, as Mary applies her popped-out boobs. The artist consciously aimed to bring them down to our level a bit. The visit of Frederick and Mary has further symbolic significance. Scandinavianisation of the British monarchy is perhaps the only option. As it transforms itself from its imperial past, the selling of the Royal Yacht Britannia was the moment of truth there, it will become something like the more acceptable bicycle monarchies on the continent. Consider how far the Queen has adapted already. From forbidding her sister Margaret from marrying in 1955 Group Captain Peter Townsend, since he was a divorced man, to clearly giving her, her blessing to the wedding of Wills and Kate, who had been, as Prince Charles put it, practising as a couple for eight years. Kate Middleton is the first commoner to marry someone directly in line to the throne or a king since the time of Henry VIII. While this particular instance owes little to Australia, it is probably true to say that the Windsor's experience here has helped them to perceive the monarchy in a different way. That seems to have been the case right from the beginning. Prince Alfred, although a naval officer, became more and more cavalier about the loyal effusions that regularly awaited him, and so soon developed a reputation for marked unpunctuality. In our own times, relatively casual royal walkabouts were first ventured here during the Royal Tour of 1970, and are still called walkabouts in Britain. Australia may also have given William more confidence to adopt a popular style as his default position. William's demotic style may help to save the monarchy in Britain, where there are considerable arguments for its retention. 
In the context of Americanization, trading as globalization, plus pressure from Brussels, the monarchy becomes the ultimate statement of British difference. It is also the case that should Scotland become independent, a real possibility now, there could be agreement, given the Stuart inheritance, to the Queen remaining as joint head of state. Indeed, the Scotnats have indicated acquiescence to, to, to that. There's not the faintest chance that a president of England would be so regarded. In Ireland, too, the monarchy has its uses, as we saw in May 2011. At a state banquet, the Queen appeared like a deus ex machina, and with a classic display of tact, was able to convincingly express regret for past wrongs. What gave the occasion resonance was that, as the veritable embodiment of the continuity of British history, she also implicitly apologised on behalf of her ancestors. Imagine, by way of contrast, how shallow it would have been had the Queen delivered the 2008 apology to the Aborigines. But to return to England itself, the Kingsley Martin argument that the monarchy stood at the pinnacle of the English class system, endorsing its snobberies, is less persuasive now, given the access of new money and the creation of new social contours. Finally, the weekly conversation between the Queen and the Prime Minister of the day is an admirable institution. <coughs> Mrs Thatcher must have felt as though she was going to confession. Unfortunately, we can't replicate it here, since the Governor-General has no independent standing, and increasingly, not even a decent pair of capital letters to her name. Monarchist spokespeople in Australia are inclined to trot out traditional arguments for the monarchy as though the context in Britain and Australia were exactly the same. A notable exception is Tony Abbott, whose political career really began with his directorship of Australians for a constitutional monarchy. Always a convinced monarchist, tellingly, he shied away from going up to the Queen at an Oxford reception in case he was disappointed. What he wanted, he explained in a book teasingly called The Minimal Monarchy, was a new intellectual basis for supporting the Crown, quote, to replace the accident of Britishness which gave it to us. To do this, Abbott conscripts an old term often applied to the more advanced 18th century American colonies to describe Australia as a crowned republic. He builds unwittingly on the position of the Whitlam government characterising the Australian monarchy as consisting not only of the Queen, but of Governors and the Governor-General, Australians. In effect, Abbott's argument runs, the Governor-General is our Head of State already. The Queen becomes merely the instrument of appointment of these Australians. Quote, if Australians were starting from scratch, Abbott concedes, we would be unlikely to choose the monarch of another country, represented here by a Governor-General appointed by the Prime Minister. Rather like Braganza Brazil, the argument rests on the happy circumstances which brought us to this position, rather than devolution or deliberate policy. To bring in a republic, the argument goes, would change the existing system which has served us well, in unpredictable ways which many would reject. And of course, Abbott points to the legal difficulties, in particular those arising from the coexisting separate sovereignties of the states. So wedded is he to the status quo, that he has come to describe the monarchy as almost, but not quite, an indigenous crown. Certainly, some conservatives seem to feel that with the movie The King's Speech. For them, it was heaven. A stuttering monarch in a fustian court taught how to manage things better by applying a little Aussie know-how. At the present moment, a number of scenarios present themselves. Certainly, the, monarch will go, the monarchy will go on at least until the Queen dies. Amanda Vanstone's suggestion that the Queen is woman enough to have the issue discussed before she goes is probably correct. But popular opinion, even if it were more in favour of a republic than it is at the moment, would be against such a move. Yet it would not be unprecedented. It was known perfectly well before William IV died and Victoria succeeded him that Hanover was under the Salic law which debarred female succession. On Queen Victoria's accession, it would part from Britain as it did, under the rule of her nearest available male relative. There is, of course, always the possibility that Britain, or England, as it might be in 30 or 50 years' time, might become a republic before we do. Anti-monarchist sentiment could accelerate quickly under Charles, 
already the object with Camilla of the most violent anti-royal demonstration in London so far, apart from 1642. <laughs> At the beginning, uh, sorry, the ground is shifting under the feet of the royals. At the beginning of the Queen's reign, everyone would have understood why, at the news of Diana's death, the flagpole at Buckingham Palace remained empty. The convention had always been that it supports the royal standard only, and this personal flag of the Queen is flown only when she is in residence. But newspaper editors, who might be expected to know better, led the charge, demanding that a flag be flown at half-mast. So, in concession to public opinion, up went the Union Jack. It was the first chip off the block. The idea, supported in a number of influential quarters, that the succession should leapfrog over Charles to William, though resisted by the prince himself, would be a serious variation of the hereditary principle. The monarchy could be weakened further. It could eventually compromise itself out of existence. Under such circumstances, the monarchy might decide to transfer its location, not just having a residence in Thawa, as Neville Shute conjectured, but moving into Yarralumla. Not everyone would be pleased by this development, including many monarchists to whom distance does lend a considerable enchantment. This includes quite a few conservative politicians. Nick Minchin said on Q&A a year ago that the personality of the monarch was an irrelevance. It was the system that mattered. Similarly, while John Howard found it easy enough to elbow out his Governor-General, the military man, from some public occasions, it would be much more difficult to displace a king. In short, it is too late for a Braganza rerun. While such a move might solve problems for the Windsors, it would create more for us. Canberra will never be, in any sense, the new Rio. It is ludicrous that monarchists, surfing the, the popularity of Prince William, should speak as though the monarchy is safe in Australia for another century. True, William's post-flood tour in March 2011 followed by the royal wedding in April, did see support for the Republic dropping to its lowest level for 17 years. But his appeal is essentially that of a celebrity, a pleasant personality and fading good looks. It does not generally spring from a commitment to the monarchy as a political concept, at least not among the young. A recent poll of Generation Y people aged 18 to 30 years found 32% recognised the Victorian Premier, Ted Bagley, 26% Quentin Bryce, and 78% Edward Cullen, the vampire hero in the Twilight series. <laughs> Enthusiasm, such as it is, is shallow. The Australian Monarchist League, according to its website, has 15,000 members. Social networking could lock them in for a time. But dwindling membership is, after all, a characteristic of both major political parties. In Australia, at least, the star quality of the monarchy seems to be expediting its trivialisation. A Daily Telegraph editorial commenting on the royal wedding said the couple both come across as extremely well-mannered, a little shy and up for a laugh. In other words, they both seem very Australian. A little work on the accents and they'd be perfect. To be, to be created in our own image is one thing, to be refracted from a cartoon, quite another. Images posted on the net suggested the royal couple's costumes were modelled on Cinderella's. Not only was this preposterous, but it was also wrong. In the Cinderella animation, the colours worn differed substantially. The Queen's visit for Chogham in 2011, while a success, could be said to have been running on empty. It was widely anticipated as her last. Crowds flocked to see her. In Melbourne's Federation Square, she drew a bigger crowd than Oprah Winfrey. The Occupy Melbourne post protesters postponed a conflicting demonstration, sensible, since going ahead with it would have been unpopular. This apparent mark of respect underlined the retro flavour of the Queen's day in the city. She opened the Royal Children's Hospital, as she had done in 1963. Fortunately, it was a different building. But there was no soundtrack, not a single speech in the entire visit. At the hospital, the Queen simply drew aside the curtain on the plaque. The Melbourne excursion was a trip down memory lane, bathed in sunshine. I don't know what all the fuss is about with her outfit, one girl was heard to remark. She's not Lady Gaga or anything. <laughs> not long afterwards, the Danish royal couple made a return visit, no less successful than their first. Once again, people responded to, quote, Australia's own royal, Crown Princess Mary. 
The monarchy appears safe for the moment. Even Malcolm, even Malcolm Turnbull says a lot of Republicans are Elizabethans as well. A news poll in April 2011 found support for the Republic was 10% lower than it had been at the time of the failed referendum in 1999. Moreover, only 40% of those between 18, aged between 18 and 34 backed the Republic, and only half of them unequivocally. Such a dramatic shift might reflect the popularity of the royal family, or a growing conservatism, but also deep disenchantment with Australia's political leadership. Quite apart from distrust of what some people term the politician's republic. Often the referendum is cited as though the republic's defeat is carved in stone. But sooner or later the figures will swing back. People scoffed at Winifred Ewing as a solitary Scottish nationalist being elected to the House of Commons in 1967. Now there is a Scottish nationalist government in Edinburgh with independence a distinct possibility. While there are more pressing issues in the Republic, nothing shows more clearly the lack of vision that seems to have crept across our whole political system. Often the Republicans seem to have been just waiting for the Windsor to fall into a hole. None will be big enough, not even for King Charles. As Tony Abbott showed in the minimal monarchy, a sophisticated argument can be mounted for maintaining the status quo. Moreover, questions such as changing the flag in the Republic have become more complex since they are affected by a new factor evident since the mid-1990s, evident ever since Pauline Hanson donned the flag as a drake. They have come to serve as algebraic symbols, expressing hostility and resistance towards multicultural Australia and what the country has become generally. Multiculturalism is an unambiguous change for the better, conceded Tony Abbott in 1995, but it has also contributed to a feeling that Australians are no longer masters in their own house. Becoming a republic may confirm Australian suspicions that they live in an age where everything is disposable. Since there is little vision in our public discourse, it is not surprising that the concern about identity should take regressive forms. It is telling that the further away from the CBDs you moved in each state in 1999, the higher the vote against the Republic became. This tendency of the periphery to remain symbolically conservative is at least as old as the Royalist rising in the Vendée in revolutionary France. And the nearest Australian equivalent of that was Joe Bjorki Peterson's proposal to have Elizabeth II separately proclaimed Queen of Queensland, rightly ridiculed as the peanut queen. Even so, the dramatic changes in Australia's population in recent years will inexorably work against the monarchy. One of the striking things about the Conservative case for its retention, even when argued most articulately, articulately is the rather static view it seems to hold of society, extending to its constituent population groups. So the day will come, even a bit unexpectedly perhaps, for the enactment of Donald Horne's adage about the monarchy giving way to pressure like a lightly locked door. Growing consciousness of Australia's changing context, arising from the dramatic rise of China and India to become major powers, might also give it a job. This lecture has not considered the Republican position, nor the way Australia gradually moved to full independence from Britain under the monarchy. What it has sought to show is that while the monarchy hangs on, it has done so after a long period of attenuation. There are occasional reports that the royals themselves have been surprised that we should have ch chosen to continue the existing arrangements. At the moment, the monarchy is treating us to a full-throated swan song by loyal ventriloquists. Increasingly, there are tensions arising from different perspectives. Two years ago, the recent convention that the Governor-General was head of state with the Queen our Sovereign was upset by an announcement from the palace that casually assumed the Queen to be both. English understanding of colonial niceties is not great. This was evident in Clarence House's banning of the chaser from commenting on the royal wedding. The Brits don't get it. Humour in Australia is serious, perhaps the main way of exciting public interest in politics. Don Watson began writing lines for Max Gillies and ended up writing speeches for Paul Thede. Then there was the Order of Merit awarded to John Howard. The order is the gift of the sovereign, and Howard's elevation falls within the expected range. 
the former Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien became a member in 2009. But since the monarchy is supposed to be above politics, it is not a good book. John Howard still engages in political debate whenever he has the opportunity. Moreover, the honour looked like a reward for services to the monarchy. A generation ago, the order had rewarded achievement in the arts and sciences, and most of its 24 members are still drawn from those worlds. At a pinch, the award might have gone to Barry Humphreys, not to one best described as Sandy Stone on speed. The monarchy was brilliantly used by the British as the cornerstone of the empire in its late phase of devolution. Its existence was the projection of a larger-than-life royal family at a time when the ties of kinship were still very real enabled the dominions to develop the fullest autonomy while still being part of the whole. It neatly reconciled liberty and empire, enabling a scattered people to be, as Keith Hancock put it, British with a small thing. But once the dominions began to function fully as nation-states, and the blood ties of kinship became diluted, the assumptions on which a shared monarchy was predicated became less and less operative. Voltaire, in the 18th century, said of the Holy Roman Empire, the wealth of states in Germany, that it was neither holy, nor Roman, nor empire. Today it is obvious that the one-time British Commonwealth is neither British, nor common, nor indeed wealthy. It is Australia we have to consider now, not the empire or commonwealth. The old-style monarchical solution no longer serves us so well. More and more, its continuation seems to postpone the problems of recalibrating forms of government for this, this successor state of the British Empire. Meanwhile, debate in the Republic comes in waves, partly because, apart from changing circumstances, the monarchist and Republican cases stand almost independently of each other. They rarely engage. One is essentially traditionalist, while the other likes to align itself with what it perceives to be the future, at the moment without much sense of vision. Each is powerfully rooted in sentiment. The monarchists are primarily concerned now with the system of government. The Republicans, beyond their democratic arguments, with having our own separate head of state. So desperate is Bob Carr to have the Republic that his minimalist model retains the title Governor-General. Blink and you scarcely notice the change. The best way the two positions could be reconciled is in a separate Australian monarchy. A similar idea has been floated in Canada, Prince Harry the King. But its realisation here would be absurd. Australians have no taste for pomposity. A local Australian monarchy would soon founder turning out to be a mere staging post on the road to a republic. It is a lost option. No Australian monarchy then, and no royal governor general, just royalty as visiting celebrities. So the problem is essentially post-imperial. The monarchy grew out of the English society and polity. When will the Australian society and polity grow out of the English monarchy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, for such a thoughtful and entertaining lecture. Um, and I'll just let everyone know that, that, that the lecture will be published in the next issue of Griffith Review, which I think will be out very May. shortly, in May. Okay, 1st of May. We do have time for a couple of questions. Thank you very much. I saw a most interesting program on television a few years ago from the BBC, and it commenced with a historical fact that somewhere back in the 18th century, and the writer of British history isn't too good, there was a dispute over the, the laws of succession. And at one stage it was a close run thing as to who would be the next monarch. And, okay, it was disputed somehow, and A was chosen as the monarch, and B was deposed. And so they said, well, what happened to me and these descendants? And they did sort of a reverse of who do you think you are, you know? They changed the descendants of B right down and said, who would be the monarch now and B being chosen to be the monarch then? And 
there was a cocky about Tocum. Oh, <laughs> there was a middle-aged gentleman at the Reign of Beauty, and he said, well, he was a bit old to actually be taking the role, but the next institution, he had a few daughters, the next institution was his daughter, Kyan. So the move was that she would be appointed Queen Kyanie the first. Now, we could have her as Queen of Australia, but I say, why not reverse takeover and make her Queen Kyanie the first of the British Empire? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, and then she could dress to look a little bit like the Rogue Queen in, on the uh, flyer for the, yeah. for the section. <laughs> um, you mentioned how um, I think that Tony Abbott's book, he said that the, because the states were at their own sort of sovereignty of sort of yeah. territory, um, yeah, there are constitutional difficulties. Does that like include the fact that each Australian state and territory has, has um, inherited various British constitutional documents like Magna Carta and stuff like If we were to become a republic, isn't it a, a, bit, a, bit, a, bit, a bit difficult having sort of British, like imagine having um, the American Declaration of Independence? Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, well, we, 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 we have had this problem in the past because the thing is, the which the Federation was formed, it was really a compact between the different colonies, and they only surrendered certain powers. And that makes it quite different from Canada and New Zealand or you know, South Africa used to be. So that's why Australia uniquely has this problem of the double, of the, of the double sovereignty. And so, and basically, it requires a constitutional, uh, a series of constitutional meetings and an agreement among the states, just as they eventually agreed to come together to remove, in the mid 80s, the, the last residual laws, which were colonial relics, which still bound Australia in various ways. But it did actually require the states' cooperation to do that. So, I imagine this would, this would be a similar, similar sort of thing. monarchy is very interesting because ever since the, ever since the, uh, the, the West Indies uh, slave emancipation by the Queen's proclamation in 1838, there has often been a case where the indigenous people, certainly I know in, uh, in, in the West Indies and in, uh, and in Australia and I believe in New Zealand, have had a special, felt they have a special relationship with the monarchy and, uh, and often feel threatened by attempts to remove it. Um, in the case of Jamaica, it was overcome, and uh, it's, it's now on the verge of becoming a republic. But it took a long time. And that's a rather interesting situation when you think that the, that the people who have, could actually claim English descent in Jamaica were very, very few. And it was really rooted in the sentimental time. Just a quick one. Um, would it be possible for a government to make us a republic without a referendum? I can remember when the Australia Act was passed, we broke from the Privy Council without a referendum. So I thought we'd be legal. I think at one stage, um, wasn't Keating going to ask the Queen to resign as uh, monarch of Australia? Is this at all possible without a referendum? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I mean, it would be suicide for any government to do that. And. Uh, um, I do, I'm not even sure it would be possible. I, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't no, really answer no, answer that question. Because because the law, the, I mean, the, the law is such a, a wilderness of rectitude. Um, and and for example, that that, that uh, one 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 slight um, variant which I wasn't aware of till recently is that Canada, which of course is much more seriously. Uh, a monarchical proposition in Australia because it, of course many of the first people who, the first settlers who went to Canada fled from the United Mistakes as I affectionately called America um, after the revolution so there's always been a kind of much stronger monarchical in, intrinsic, or, intrinsic monarchical feeling in Canada and for this reason when Canada uh, set up the, 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 uh, the, the separate crown of Canada it wasn't stipulated that the king or queen of Canada had to be the, had to be the British king or queen 
uh, there is actually a, a room for variation there. So that's why I'm saying there are all sorts of quirks and things, and I, I wouldn't like to be quoted uh, with an explicit answer on that. But I just think it would be politically impossible. It would be political suicide for any government to try that. And I don't think they would. I mean, there is no point in just forcing through a republic. You've got to feel, effectively, that two-thirds of the people in the country want it. Um, it's only if you're Afrikaners in South Africa and you've got fantasies about how you were conquered in the Boer War that, you, that it's one in the eye for the English, so you're very happy with any majority, no matter how slender it is. But that's a very different situation. And I think on, on that note, we'll end the lecture this evening. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you to our audience for coming, um, contributing questions, and it's been a very enjoyable evening. Thank you.